It's iBook Bindings podcast, uh, and today our guest is uh, uh, Jay Tanner, bookbinder, and uh, many things more. Uh, we'll discuss, uh, I guess, many, many of the activities that uh, uh, Jay... Uh, I forgot the word. <laughs> Sorry. Gets myself into. <laughs> yeah, gets, gets himself into. That's right. Thank you. Um, I'm Stepan, uh, my co-host uh, joins us from Moscow, uh, his name is Pavel, hi Pavel, hi Jay, hi. and uh, well, just uh, tell us a bit about yourself, uh, because I, I know you as a bookbinder, as a book collector, but you also uh, do things with vintage furniture, you also <laughs> drive a school bus, so yeah, lots of yeah. stuff, please tell us about yourself. Yeah, I live in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, it's kind of smack in the middle of the United States. Um, and I've been bookbinding for almost 10 years. Um, I started a little bit in high school, but not, not a ton of stuff. Um, and then in college, I really kind of got into it. Um, yeah, I, I like uh, Stepan said, I drive a school bus during the day. I also am a janitor at night, <laughs> so kind of all over the board. Um, and then those two things are helping me to afford my master's degree, which I'm trying to finish, which is a master's in conservation. So that's kind of the end goal. Um, but yep, I do bookbinding in my studio here, uh, which is in my garage, um, and I uh, collect books <laughs> on bookbinding. So yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess we'll show some of the some of the photos you sent me uh, during this uh, video. And what was your uh, bachelor's degree? My 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 bachelor's degree is art history and printmaking. They didn't have a bookbinding department, so I um, I got it. I did bookbinding in the printmaking department. Mm -hmm. And you 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 did this all uh, locally in Kansas City, or how does it work? Yeah, it's uh, it's the Kansas City Art Institute. Um, it's probably 30 minutes from my house, so it was really good. I got a really great scholarship to go there because it's a very expensive school. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I was able to get a scholarship, and that paid for a lot of my schooling. So that's good. Okay, so you are already a, a book professional, at least from the theoretical point of view. Uh, you got it. Work. You got it. <laughs> yeah, but but what about book binding? And uh, uh, do you make books mostly as a hobby mostly as a uh, you know uh, on your on your path to become a, a better bookbinder or do you do any commissions how does it work yeah um i every once in a while i take the odd conservation commission um i don't do too much of that because i'm still learning um eventually i'd like to be a conservator in like a library or a museum or something like that but um, really, I, I've been getting super into fine binding. And so I think eventually I would love to do fine bindings on the side and then go to my day job and restore books during the day. But that's kind of like the end goal. <laughs> so right now it's just mostly a lot of learning and um, that sort of thing. And do you see your future in Kansas City or do you think you'll have to move to find a, a job? Maybe there are not very many book conservators around. I mean, there's one in uh, Wichita, Kansas. There's one in um, St. Louis, Missouri. So those are probably the closest. Um, there's not very many in the Midwest. There's a lot on the East Coast. There's a lot on the West Coast, but um, the Midwest doesn't have too many. So that might be a good thing for me. But is, <laughs> but is there a market for you? Yeah, yeah. And are there independent uh, uh, conservators or they work for inti institutions? How does it work? Uh, the two that I just mentioned in, in St. Louis and Wichita are independent. Um, the, the only institution that I know of, and I could be wrong, that has a book conservator is um, the Linda Hall Library, which is known for its science and math reference books. They have a really rare collection of science and math books. Um, there's a lot of paper conservators in Kansas City, like the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, um, which was built in the 30s. Um, they have paper conservators and a photo conservator. Um, but yeah, not, not too many book conservators around here. So, so there is a chance for you to, yeah. <laughs> to stay there. But uh, what you're, uh, you're originally from, from Kansas City. So, uh, yep. 
and you you i guess you would prefer to stay there closer to your family and relatives <laughs> not to move yeah. somewhere i i love i love traveling um i don't know if we'll move my my wife kind of wants to move to arizona <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh but you know um to 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 higher and colder part of arizona or lower and and warm and hotter i guess not warmer <laughs> she likes the warmth i am always burning up i'm surprised i'm wearing a sweater right now because most of the time i'm i'm hot but yeah she likes warm <laughs> yeah we we, we went to, we went to arizona uh, eight years ago something like that with uh, my wife and her grandmother and uh, we flew from uh, from chicago and uh uh, arrived at after midnight and it was uh, well I don't know what it was in Fahrenheit but in, in Celsius it was plus 40 after midnight uh, so it was above 100 I guess in Fahrenheit. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, yeah, I don't like that type of, I like warmth but not, not, not that type of warmth. Right. A bit too in Kansas City it's all over the board like we were just negative 12 degrees and now it's beautiful 60 out so it's ev you know, everywhere <laughs> and negative negative uh, fahrenheit negatives are something lower in, in celsius so it's pretty cold i am really good with with millimeters yeah yeah i use that every day but i never use <laughs> celsius so. so 60 fahrenheit is 15 celsius yeah and yeah that i remember oh, and what was the other one minus minus negative 12 negative 12 uh, is oh minus 24 that's cold well yeah <laughs> yeah it was very cold that day <laughs> yeah so we were everywhere i mean and it's you know now it's like t-shirt weather outside you can walk outside and it's beautiful and who knows yeah. this this year is absolutely strange because uh, so uh this night we have we had uh, uh something at 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 the freezing point uh, temperature at around freezing point, but uh, two or three weeks ago we had uh, uh, snow and ice on on canals. Uh, first time in three years here in the Netherlands, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it 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 really happens quite rarely. This uh, uh, quite quite rarely now because before that it was six uh, six years before the so three years ago and uh, and and six years earlier, nine year, nine years ago. And uh, then next week after that, uh, it went uh, to something like uh, uh, up to 17 uh, centigrade. So it will be 65, I guess, Fahrenheit or something like that. So, yeah, <laughs> it was from 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 freezing temperature to uh, pretty warm. And well, welcome to the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, could could you talk, talk a bit more about uh, uh, Kansas City? Uh, uh, what are the museums? I know uh, Nelson Atkins Museum, uh, but it's uh, uh, better known for its uh, art collection. I don't know. It has some prints, from what I remember, but does it have books? Uh, they they have some books. I don't think that they really collect that. I think you know. They have like Ar some Armenian manuscripts, some different um, really old stuff, but they only have that because it's like they view it as an art object. They do have a fantastic library, though, that's like an art reference library. And you can go there, well, pre pandemic, you could go there and, uh, you know, it's free. It, it's a huge library, but those aren't really, they're not collecting that for rarity. They're collecting it for knowledge, I guess. But yeah, so then we have the country's only World War I museum here, um, which is also a beautiful structure. You should look that up. Um, and uh, what else do we have? We have a lot of universities around here. So, you know, if you ever want to do research or anything, it's, it's pretty nice to, to have like four or five universities to pick from, depending on the subject. Um, so that's kind of cool. I'm asking because uh, it's not uh, immediately clear to me what uh, drove you to uh, to your hobbies, to your to your interests, not hobbies, to your future profession. Oh. I mean, uh, how did you get into conservation, into bookbinding, if you didn't have that much contact with, uh, with it? Especially if you you started making books in high school. Uh, well, that's uh, not not uh, not many, I guess. Uh, future bookbinders start to making books in high school. <laughs> yeah. So we had a we had a printmaking class in high school. 
and I wanted to buy and and I've always I've collected books a lot longer than I've been a a bookbinder, and they weren't books on bookbinding like I collect now. They were just you know stuff I found interesting. But so I wanted to bind the prints that I made in high school, and so I had to kind of start learning that. And my my high school instructor kind of helped me with that. And then when I was a freshman in college, I took a class. Uh, he's he's passed away now, but his name was Carl Kurtz. Carl with a C, uh, Kurtz with a K. And mm -hmm. you can actually look up his calligraphy online. Uh, there's not very much of it digitized, unfortunately. He had a lot more that I wish they would publish. But anyway, he was a, a known calligrapher who kind of dabbled in um, bookbinding. So I took a course with him and that just, you know, set me on my way. And then I had an art history professor who goes, have you ever heard of conservation? And I was like, no. And she's like, well, it's kind of a mix of all your interests. You like book binding, you like antique books, you know, and I had never heard of it before. And so that's a, probably about sophomore year, I started moving toward conservation. And I had a year long internship at the Nelson Atkins with the photo conservator there. Um, and then I had kind of a, an internship with her mentors who are private practice and they're now kind of in semi-retirement also. Um, so yeah, I just kind of met the right people, had the right people tell me different things and then here I am. <laughs> and what books were, were you collecting and uh, what led you there? Because that's an unusual hobby for a young man. Yeah, I think, I think, I think a lot of book collectors start off this way. I kind of was like, oh, the oldest book I can get my hands on, you know, which now looking back is maybe not that old but you know I was like you know I want old books you know and so it was really anything that I could get my hands on that was cheap because you know yeah you know, I didn't have a whole lot of money I still don't but <laughs> so yeah they um they just whatever sh struck me in was cheap enough but now I've kind of weeded out a lot of my collection and really focused it to be books on book binding or I do have historical structures so like if I want to ever try to recreate something I've got like an example of it it's interesting how uh, every next story we uh, uh, discuss uh, connects with uh, not maybe not all of the previous episodes of our podcast, but 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 with many of them because we just recorded a cup a couple of uh, uh, podcasts uh, that really will resonate with the things <laughs> you are talking about and, and that we're discussing. So how big uh, how big is your collection on uh, book, uh, book binding? I haven't, I've only just started cataloging it. So I don't know, like I never, I never even thought to do, to, to put a list of all the titles and everything together. And then my wife actually goes, you know, if anything ever happened to this house, like uh, that would be bad. And, and so I was trying to get it insured and basically they won't insure it if they don't know what it's worth. And the appraisers that need to know what it's worth have to have a list. So I'm kind of in the middle of knowing how much, but um, just book binding books, I would say, see, it's easier for me to say uh, in, in library terms, you know, a book length of a foot, you know, so I have probably, I have maybe like a hundred book foot on, on a shelf, you know, so I have I, ha I have maybe eight shelves full of bookbinding books. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I don't know. I don't know. Stepan, what what about you? Because you've almost cataloged your collection. I am. Yeah. I'm just I'm just now starting. So it's like I have I've barely barely started. But I would say I would say not including any of the periodicals uh, and the the newsletters and things like that, magazines. I I think I have um, maybe four hundred ish books on bookbinding yeah so yeah some, some some are some are duplicates also you know like i might own a first edition of something that i don't want to read or use and then what i do then is like behind me yeah that shelf is all like my practical books that i don't that i can beat around the library or around the studio and maybe get glue on accidentally or something um and so I'm not even, I'm not counting those either, but yeah. So some are rare, some are duplicates, some are not rare at all, you know, just kind of all over the board. Yeah. I guess I have something like some, something between uh, 12 and 1300 at the moment. And uh, yeah, that's including periodicals, that's including uh, uh, duplicates, not, not many duplicates, but still there are some and uh, well, 
Yeah. So I'll have I, to get back. I'll have to get back with you on that <laughs> when I get <laughs> cataloged, and we'll see. <laughs> Do you use any software? Uh, because I guess uh, some some uh, members of our audience would be interested in uh, how how. You do you catalog your uh, book collection? Yeah, right now, right now it's just a Word document, um, but I want to put it into something, especially some. I want. I'm looking for something that has that can have like maybe a photo or two per book, also. Um, and there was actually a nice discussion on um, the Rare and Vintage Books page on Facebook about mm -hmm. people uh, using different catalog softwares, and I can't remember them at the moment, but I wrote them down and they had pros and cons of each and I, I haven't looked into them yet because I'm only using Google Docs, but yeah, but someday I would like it all nice and neat and something you could print a PDF out of and, you know, have it, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm using, um, there is this company, collectors.com mm -hmm. and they have a bunch of uh, different applications for different sorts of collections. Uh, 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 they had uh, uh, an app for DVDs and stuff, but uh, yeah, that's. Oh, cool. uh, I guess this is obsolete now, <laughs> or almost obsolete. But uh, they they also had an app for comic books, and uh, they have uh, 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 they have uh, an application for books as well. And uh, well, it it had uh, it has its uh, downsides, and I'm not always happy with how it works. But uh, it it has a. Uh, computer version for uh, for Mac or PC. It has an, uh, a smartphone version and it had a, has a web, web interface. And this is pretty important for me because when I go to a, a book market, for example, I can access uh, my collection right away uh, on the spot and check if uh, uh, the book I want to buy is a duplicate of something I already have or it's a, a, a new book or it's a better copy or if it was... Uh, uh, cheaper when I bought it before or uh, well, so you can make uh, much more uh, better decisions uh, uh, based on this additional information. And of course, it's it's really hard to remember all of your books uh, when when you have more than I don't know, 100 of them. <laughs> so it's it's, it's collectors.com, you said? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. And do they allow pictures? pictures to be yeah they allow pictures but uh, uh i i don't i'm not sure about uh, other apps I, I i i tried some of them and i know there are free there are uh, other others that are uh, not free and demand some payments this one is is uh, for money so uh i have to pay uh, a yearly fee or something but uh, i guess you can you can go with a monthly fee but i'm not sure because uh, now i now I pay a yearly fee and I, I just put it on my business account and uh, uh, well. That's cool. Uh, uh, I know uh, why Stepan collects uh, uh, these books. I mean, apart from just because he can. Uh, yeah, he, just, uh, just because I'm a hoarder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Me <a> too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a hoarder with a big house, finally. Uh, well, we'll see how it goes in France. Yeah, because, yeah. But at, at least you can justify it to yourself because you scan some of those books and upload them on your uh, website. So it is kind of part of your uh, web presence. I guess that's how I justify that to my wife in the first place. <laughs> that's, that's nice. <laughs> uh, uh, so what about you? How do you justify it to yourself and your wife? Yeah, that's that's kind of a hard one because she looks at it like you know another one really. What is what does this book tell you that these other four hundred plus books don't tell you? And yeah, I mean, I have also kind of a weird thing that I like to collect, which in some of the books that I have to show you, um, will kind of show that I like. Well, Erica, my wife, calls it meta bookbinding books. So like books. Books owned by their by, by their authors or signed by their authors or bound by their authors or things like that. Anytime there's a multiple connection um, in the book, that's when I really really like it. Um, Do you have to give, give some examples? Yeah, I have I have I have a, a stack over here that I'd, I'd be glad to show you. This is a, a book that I know a lot of people um, have. Um, but this is a first edition. It doesn't doesn't want to not, focus. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Now it's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's Douglas Cockerell's the artistic uh, bookbinding series. This is the first edition, and it's uh, signed by Cockerell. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of like a, an example of something that I really like because it's you know 
it's got that multiple connection. Um, this one is bound by an amateur bookbinder that they didn't sign the book. Um, but what I like about it is it's the same title. It's a first edition, and it's also um, bound kind of in the style of Douglas Cockerell. You know, there's the blind tooling with the gold tooling. I don't know. And um, so, you know, I wish that they had signed it, but um, it's just kind of nice to have like a nice leather bound uh, edition of it. And it's from about this time period. So, and since Douglas Cockerell was one of the big teachers, um, it may have been bound by one of his students or things like that. Cause a lot of his students bound books in a similar style. Um, I, I remember these two books from, from the photos you sent us before uh, our call. Oh, and yes. I was like, okay, yeah, I see them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> on the shelf, yeah. Um, and then recently I got uh, some books from the Zanesdorf library. I bought them from Oak Knoll uh, who bought them from Forest Books in the UK. Uh, who actually bought them from the Zanesdorf Library when they were getting rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, this one is pretty cool. Uh, this is uh, Joseph Zanesdorf's uh, technical series. Um, but what's neat about it is it has the uh, Zanesdorf book plate in it. Mm -hmm. And it also says this is the first edition of the series E. Zanesdorf. And so this is actually the son of... Uh, Joseph William Zainsdorf. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, whose ex libris is that? Um, it's the Zainsdorf libraries. Uh, so the, the EZ on the uh, thing is for Edward Zainsdorf. He's the third of that line that uh, had the Zainsdorf firm. Oh, I like this. Bind fast, find fast. Yeah. And, and actually, I have another one, which I didn't pull uh, from the shelf, but uh, his father and grandfather's book plate were actually in German. And so it says, uh, bind fast, find fast in German, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, so this is uh, his personal copy of his dad's book, which is kind of neat. Um, and then we have the 1913 edition of this book, and then the original, the original edition of this book, um, which is 1905. And this is Edward Zainsdorf's copy. And what's kind of cool, when I first got it, I was a little bit upset by the cross out on the front cover. But I think that, they, that he did that because they were changing the cover in 1913. And I also think that uh, he, he's written in here, um, he disagrees with his grandfather a lot. <laughs> he, he, says, he says, well, that's not entirely true. Or, you know, he'll, he, and so it's just marked up and things are crossed out and everything. And um, from what I understand, they meant to reprint this and then remake it for the 1913 copy. But what they actually did, they didn't sell enough of this copy and they had um, a bunch of the middle part left uh the text block left and so they just put a new wrapper <laughs> on the old text block so actually you open the 1913 copy and it's got the 1905 publication date on it so they really didn't change a lot but i think that that's kind of neat um and then i also really like um book binding genealogy so you know who taught who taught who um i think that that's really cool and so like uh, Sarah Perdue, um, the famous female bookbinder, learned from Zainsdorf. And so I don't have one of her bindings, but I have the first and later edition of this. This is a catalog of books bound by S.T. Perdue. Um, mm -hmm. And it's signed by the author to Percy Adams from the author and writer. And um, it's kind of got some information about her bindings and then there are some plates in the back. Um, and so she actually learned at the Zanesdorf firm, which is kind of neat. Um, this is the later edition that's a little bit easier to find. Um, this was published by Norfolk Square, London, Nicholas Smith. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of cool. I have, you know, her, her mentors books and then I have this book that she had um, and then Sarah Perdue taught three different women. That's another key thing in my, my collection is I like to collect bindings by women, um, especially from kind of the turn of the last century. Um, I 
don't, I can't afford them very often, but when I find one, <laughs> you know, I kind of grab a hold of it. This is kind of a neat book by a binder named Maud Nathan, who unfortunately passed away in 1910 due to some complications that she had medically. But um, this book is a book that she actually translated. It's uh, the decoration of leather. It's got some issues up here, obviously some loss. Um, but it was translated from the French. Um, I'm gonna botch this, I'm sure, but, and, and you can tell that the board, uh, the front board is detached. Yeah. This one lives in a box most of its life. But anyway, it's bound by Maud Nathan. She's also inscribed it. Mm -hmm. I hope this is showing up well. Yeah, a bit, a bit to the left maybe, or uh, away from, from yourself. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, yeah. This is much better, yeah. And um, it's this is kind of interesting, actually. This signature mark, if you look up Maud Nathan's bindings, she eventually has a tool made, or maybe she made it herself, where it's this M that turns into an N kind of mark. Um, and that happens on later bindings. This is an earlier binding, and she actually just signed the Dentel area with just a normal MN, mm -hmm. 1907. So this is uh, really close to when she passed away because she passed away in 1910. So she didn't make very many bindings. So I think that's kind of cool that I have a book that she helped translate and also bound, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And so she was a student, uh, one of three female students of Sarah Perdoe. Um, it's kind of neat. Um, I can keep going. I have a stack. If you guys yeah, are sure, sure. Stack. It's 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 fun. <laughs> We love books. Yeah. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> um, this is my most recent buy. Now, this is one of the the one the things that this is one of the few books that Erica did not um, shudder at, thankfully. Um, so, like I said, I collect books by females, and I never thought that I would own a Guild of Women binders binding because they always go way out of my budget. But this one popped up and I was able to get it. And surprisingly, it's actually in the 1902 uh, book, um, The Bindings of Tomorrow. And so here is The Bindings of Tomorrow. And it was uh, put together by Frank Carslake, who kind of uh, sort of helped establish these women and get them together. Um, and he owned a bindery called the Hampstead Bindery. But uh, number 33, in the book is actually the book that we're about to see. Mm -hmm. This was bound by Lillian Overton. I could find very little about her. Um, she kind of disappeared in history, which kind of stinks, but this is one of three books in The Bindings of Tomorrow that were bought by Edward VII, uh, the King of England. He bought three of these uh, for this exhibition. And one of them was Lillian Overton's binding which is here, get the book carefully here. The boards are not detached on this, but they're very close to it. So um, mm -hmm. be careful, but. Yeah. This is amazing. So um, it has some damage to the cover, which I have done some kind of testing on and I can't get it off with everything that I've tried. So I'm deciding to leave it alone for a while. But it's got a little bit of damage there, some white, um, and then obviously the the board is kind of splitting a little bit. But is it is it some uh, abrasive damage or biological damage? I'm not sure. It's white, and I'm hoping it 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 didn't react to anything that I usually use for mold. Yeah. But I'll tell you what it seems like. There's some kind of holes um, and abrading in the leather everywhere the little white spots are. And I'm wondering if someone didn't try to use like putty or filler or some kind of, um, you know, I I'm not sure, like caulk or filler or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it just got all over the leather and isn't able to get off. I don't know if it's an acrylic material or, you know, what. But anyway, so um, the uh, Bindings of Tomorrow actually states how many tooled onlays there are. Um, you know, the, we have the little red flowers, the, the blue black flowers. But anyway, you open up and there's a full leather de Wow. <laughs> um, oh. and then, I don't Isn't know. this nice? 
This is fit for a king. I, I agree, which is crazy. Why do I have it? <laughs> so, you know, uh, but this actually popped up on one of the Facebook groups that I was about to leave because I got tired of everyone <laughs> posting. I got tired of everybody posting their like grandma's antique books that they thought, well, hey, this Shakespeare that they printed millions of must be worth tons of money. And <laughs> so, you know, it, it kind of was driving me nuts there for a while and I almost left and then this got posted and I thought, oh man, and, uh, but anyway, the, the back to Bloor matches um, also the front one. Uh, there's uh, Vellum Flyleaf. And this is kind of a nice, you know, this is Tennyson's poem. So there's kind of a lot of um, love stuff in here. And so you, you see the heart motifs on the front. Mm -hmm. And then on these little Vellum fly leaves, I don't know if it's going to show up, there's a little heart tooled on the very corner. In the corner, yeah, yeah, we, we can see that, that there is something, but uh, yeah, it's not not distinguishable. So yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of cool. I, like I said, I never thought that I would own one. I'm still sh in shock <laughs> that I do, but um, they, uh, I haven't seen, and you know, I haven't thoroughly looked. I've got a friend helping me. We haven't seen too many books from this book actually come to market. So we're kind of wondering, you know, like where are they? Are they all in universities? Probably. Um, and so that's kind of cool that it's in this book and, you know, present. So I like that. So uh, you you can skip this question uh, and not answer to it. But so what's what's your uh, top comfortable price you are ready to spend on a book? Oh man. Well, I'll tell you that this one was three hundred dollars, mm -hmm. which is a lot for my wife and I but not a lot for this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so sometimes, sometimes we dig a little bit into the savings. Um, I just, I just recently bought my most expensive book, which isn't here. And that was about $2,000 and that, uh, she got really mad at me for. <laughs> so. uh, was, uh, was that an investment? Is it ever an investment? Do you ever, uh, patch them and sell them on or are they all still with you? So, so I have, I've been working on that, but, you know, uh, kind of as Stepan said, I'm a little bit of a hoarder. Um, and so I have been working on that. I'll get a, I'll get a better copy of a book and then I'll sell the other copy, you know, and I've actually got like a batch of probably about 10 or 15 books that I need to sell. The, the book that I just bought, um, there were two books in the lot and I'll, I'll be having to sell one of them to be able to afford the other one. So sometimes you have to make those, you know, would I love to keep both of them? Yes. But uh, can we afford $2,000? No. <laughs> so yeah, so it's kind of, you kind of have to trade off and you kind of have to go, all right, which babies am I willing to let go of? <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I'm not comfortable yet with paying more than uh, 200 euros or something like that for, for a book. And uh, yeah, I, I guess this will change because uh, uh, my appetites uh, in, increase definitely with uh, with every year. And uh, well, several years ago, I wasn't uh, comfortable with paying more than a hundred dollars for for a book. So, and uh, yeah, when I when I bought uh, the uh, archaeology uh, of uh, uh, Medieval book binding. By the archaeology, archaeology of medieval book binding. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I forget everything today by by uh, by Sirmai. Uh, yeah, it, it it I paid for it something like uh, one hundred fifty or one hundred sixty dollars or something like that uh, because yeah it was out of print for years. Yeah. And uh, uh, I I I never uh, well I was quite happy that, that I bought it and I uh, never thought that uh, it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, but it was uh, uh, a one-of-a-kind book for me and one-of-a-kind one uh, purchase of a book for me. And um, yeah, so now m most of the things I, I buy are pretty cheap because I, 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 I just search for stuff on book markets and uh, buy uh, uh, almost everything that's, uh, that is connected to book arts uh, in, in some way. And usually many, many of the books are... Uh, they have some value on, on, on the market, but uh, oftentimes they are sold for, for peanuts because, uh, uh, yeah, these sellers on, on uh, Dutch book markets, they sell a lot of stuff just to get rid of them pretty fast. And, but but the, the most expensive book I have 
I I don't know. It's it's a uh, uh, real value. Uh, I have. Uh, uh, if you give me a moment, I find I'll find it. <laughs> because it may be it may be a nice uh, continuation of uh, of your story or addition to this story. And most, I would say that you know that that hundred dollar mark that you just said that is most of the time. Most of the time, we have about a hundred dollars in our budget that I could spend on books. Um, she would probably rather we saved it, but <laughs> um, so most of the time, I don't spend a ton of money on books. Um, there are just it just so happens that recently there's been two big ones, and they've kind of have come within months of each other and it's kind of like ah you know don't do that <laughs> so uh, do, you, do you mostly buy online um or are there any fairs in kansas city no unfortunately and actually kansas city back in like the the teens 20s and 30s used to be a big book hub the um book plate society uh was actually founded in kansas city so people that collect mm. book plates and things like that um, and so it used to have a big scene, but no, there are, um, there's really just one used bookstore. I mean, if you count the chains, like half price books or things like that, uh, there's a couple, but, um, yeah. So most of the time, uh, when my wife and I travel is when I buy it, we'll buy books. Um, and then other times it's online. Uh, what, what was your most memorable experience with the book market or a book fair? Hmm. Some particularly nice small place where you found a little treasure? I, the, the one and only time I've been out of the States, uh, I, we went to Paris and I didn't end up buying the book, but I, it's one of those things that you kind of, you know, punch yourself for later. You're like, oh, I should have got that. It was actually a book they were asking 130 euros, I guess, for it, which I didn't have at the time. You know, like I said, I didn't don't normally have this kind of money laying around, but um, it was a book bound by the Guild of Women Binders. And so that was, that was kind of, that was, let's see, we've been married for two years. So that was probably about three years ago. And ever since then, I kind of had a, a bug that I really wanted a Guild of Women Binders binding. And so, yeah, that one was there, but you, you have that moment of, oh, I know what this is, and the shopkeeper didn't know what it was. And then when I started asking more and more questions, I think she got a little bit uh, like interested, I guess. And then the price went up. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> this happens. Yeah, I found it. All right. So it's it's uh, Paul Revere and his engraving. Oh, nice. Uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, book uh, printed in uh, 1911, and uh, it's not in the best condition, so it has to be resewn. And um, so it's, it's a quite, quite nice, book, a nice book, and uh, the author is uh, William Loring Andrews. And then there is this. Over here, if you can see. So it is. Just it is. About. Oh, uh, not nineteen eleven. Just about it. Just, it was later. Uh, no, nineteen. Nineteen oh five. It it is signed in nineteen. So it is signed by the author. Um, and uh, uh, there were something like one hundred twenty of them printed, and uh, it's really nice edition. It's it's uh, it's it. Uh, it has quite an interesting paper on on the cover and. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a bit funny that uh, the the front and back covers are almost intact, but the uh, spine is is really darkened. Oh, and uh, uh, so uh, I saw this book uh, uh, at uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, booksellers here, and uh, the price was uh, seventy five euros. You can see here, and uh, but he sold he sold it to me for a half price. Oh, cool. And uh, uh, it, uh, it, it also had, has uh, 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 some stuff inside. So it was. Uh, the, the seller almost certainly didn't know who Paul Revere it was, was. It was sold in 1982 uh, for $180. Wow. And uh, 
Current price, uh, I saw some, uh, it's, it's on auctions uh, from time to time. It's uh, price is somewhere in between 200 and 400, but uh, it's for unsigned books. And yours is signed. And mine is signed, yeah. There you go, all right, nice. Very cool. Yeah, I and like that, like that, you know, where it's, uh, the author yeah yeah that's offer, yeah. that's that's that you 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 when you discuss this uh, uh connection with binders and authors and all that stuff uh, uh i i can't say that this is my thing uh to to search uh, specifically for, for this stuff but i love to find a book that has a story in it yeah uh i, I don't mean the story that is written by the author but the story of the book like uh, uh, as an object uh where there is uh, some dedication that it's not just some generic dedication or bought in, I don't know, uh, uh, in this year, uh, but the, there is something, some, something that adds uh, additional dimension. So, but well, this, this, book's ha this book has a story for me because I bought it for 37 uh, euros. Yeah. <laughs> it is definitely worth much more. Not that I plan to sell it. <laughs> right. I don't know what I would do with, you know, if I ever had to sell my books, it would be like, you know, I honestly, it's, it's kind of weird. You know, my passion for book binding is probably just as strong as my passion for my books. And if I was forced to choose to sell all my book binding equipment or keep my books, it kind of, I think I might choose the books. Like <laughs> I can buy a book press later, you know, like I, if I have to sell my, my stuff, I'll sell the, the book binding equipment and then keep my books. <laughs> Could you talk a bit more about your particular uh, uh, field of inter uh, interest in the uh, in the books you collect in the bindings? Because the uh, the names you were mentioning, Zenz, Dorf, Cockerell, Pridor, Women Book Binders, they are, uh, they are all from a very particular uh, time, from a very particular style. Uh, why that? Why them? Well, this kind of, uh, I think this kind of relates to what Stefan was talking about, my antique furniture. So my wife and I really like mission and arts and crafts. So that's kind of the, the era that I really like to, to go for. So um, any bookbinders of that time or their students or their student students, that's all kind of interesting to me. So when you look at all of Douglas Cockerell's students' bindings, they all kind of look like his style. You know, and they might do their own thing a little bit, but they kind of relate back to that sort of cockerel style, which is very arts and crafts. And so I love that. I love English arts and crafts, American arts and crafts. We also love Art Nouveau stuff. So we have some some German, English and American Art Nouveau stuff. So we kind of, you know, and again, on a school bus driver and she's a school teacher's salary, we have to kind of find it when we can get it cheap. So we also end up restoring a lot of the furniture because we'll get it in bad shape or somebody has terribly painted it, you know, like some crazy color. And so we'll have to restore it and put some work yeah, in. Yeah, I, I, I see uh, I see your post from time to time, like, oh, we find this nice, uh, I don't know, table or something like that. Who, who on earth would uh, paint it in <laughs> such, such an, with such an awful paint? It should be like without any paint at all. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I know. And I'm sure some people look at it and they go, it looks fine. And I'm going, no. <laughs> uh, a, a, fr a friend of mine uh, restores uh, uh, Russian furniture of that period and of that style, actually, right. Russian modern uh, 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 furniture. And he also finds it in some very distressing circumstances yeah. some sometimes it, it's been sc uh, uh, scraped uh, sometimes it's been painted white uh, sometimes it had added decoration i mean who does that but then you can buy it like a hundred uh, one two percent of the actual price right and uh, uh, and uh, we uh, uh, if you ever find Rus uh, Russian furniture or Russian bindings of that period, we'd, uh, we would be very interested to know about that because we, uh, we also had a very, very strong uh, tradition at that time, including women book binders. They yeah, are, yeah, yeah. They, uh, they are little known, but uh, uh, books by them do, uh, do turn up uh, on the market from time to time. And they command some very impressive prices when they are in good condition. So if you ever find them, 
hold on to them. All right. <laughs> you know those Ruskies, they have the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, and that's another thing is right now in my life, I'm still working on, like, there's a lot of English titles that I don't own yet, you know? And so right now I'm working on English title book binding books. And, and I can understand a little bit of French. And so I have a lot of French book binding books. But when it comes to like my German collection, I don't have very much. I don't think I own one Russian book binding book, which is why I kind of like to watch your uh, posts, Stepan, because every once in a while, you'll get a really interesting language one because you know, you guys have traveled quite a bit. And so that's kind of neat. So someday, I think that it would be really cool to bridge out uh, to other languages. But right now, it's kind of English because I don't even have all the English, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, every time I see something like that uh, in, in, in a language uh, that I don't know or uh, don't even have, uh, you know, the slightest chance to uh, understand at least uh, some words, uh, I, I think, well, well, why would I buy this book? And uh, usually I still buy it if it's not expensive because right. uh, when I will have another chance to do that. And, uh, but uh, if it's more than, I don't know, 20 euros, I, I, I probably wouldn't buy it. So only, only if it's cheap. And uh, sometimes, as, as you said before, uh, uh, months later, I, 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 I start thinking like, well, I should have used that, that opportunity. <laughs> Who knows when it comes. I can't find it again because, you know, I don't know if, if this is the same in your case, but you know, I've seen books that are in different languages and I won't know how to search for them again. Yeah. Now in my mind, I'll kind of go, I know the title was something like this, but it, you know, you can't, you know, so that, that makes it hard to find again if you ever want to buy it later, like online or yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I try to make photos every time I can, but not not all sellers like that. So Oh true. Yeah. Well. Uh, and what are the oldest books on book binding that are still relatively available? Uh, Victorian, pre-Victorian, Georgian? I have, uh, I think probably my oldest book binding book is the second, it's the second book binding book that was ever printed in the States on book binding. So it's from 1828. So in the spans of things, that's not very old, but there's only one book that predates that that was printed here in the states on book binding so that's kind of cool and it's just a small one and i really don't know what the purpose of this book was you know there's no illustrations there's no and it really doesn't describe how to do any of these steps i think you know it's kind of it's really small and so i think it was kind of like a pocket book guide for somebody who already knows how to do something so it tells you the steps, it, it, you know, it goes and it says, all right, well, first you'll do this, then you'll do this, then you'll do this, but it doesn't describe any of those steps on how to do those things. It's just kind of like a step-by-step, -step, like how to remember it. And that is called The Art of Bookbinding and Marbling. Cannot think of the, the author at the moment, but yeah, so that's probably the oldest bookbinding book I own. That, that, that is actually shocking. 1820s, uh, one of the oldest books like second ever printed in, in the US. So there was no no binaries before that or were they only using imported books? How, uh, how were they learning the trade? I think they were mostly, you know, they the, the apprenticeship, um, which has pretty much dissolved in the United States um, was really strong back then. And so you would learn from the person before you, you know, and who you would train with. But also I think that they did have some English and French manuals some German manuals, you know, it just depends on whichever trade your mentor learned in. That's probably the books that they had in the shop. But yeah, I think that 1808 or something like that is the very first one. And that's Arnett's book on bookbinding. Um, and this is the one that came after that. Now, Arnett's book at least is fairly descriptive. You know, some of the things may be outdated or and that's A-R-N-E-T-T. -T. I'm not 100% sure on that publication date, but it's a fairly decent sized book and it kind of goes into stuff. Whereas this book I own is just kind of surface level. I also can show something. So uh, uh, it, it, de it definitely do doesn't go uh, pretty, pretty far away in time. So uh, this is uh, uh, what, as far as I understand it, is supposed to be uh, one of the first books uh, not not fully dedicated to bookbinding, but uh, it it has a part on bookbinding, and it's uh, 
1807. Those are cool. Uh, I love those books of trades. I don't own any of them, but they're very and good. yeah. So here, here it is. Uh, I don't think it's 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 a, it's not the first edition. So it, it may be uh, maybe that uh, uh, the first edition was a couple of years earlier. Page eighty-eight, and yeah. So here it is. And does it have like the paper maker or anything? I mean, like, yeah, yeah. Usually they have like a couple cool bookish sort so, of. So, uh, brick, brick maker, rope maker, weaver, stocking weaver, carpet, carpet weaver, ladies dressmaker, pin maker, needle maker, wire drawer, paper maker, printer, bookbinder, calico printer, tin plate worker, brazier, button maker, cabinet maker, saddler, glass blower, cork cutter, watch maker. What's the point of that book? What? Well, it, it describes some some basic uh, uh, things about the craft and uh, uh, some basic uh, techniques. Yeah, so it's a book of hand skill, you know, like uh, different trades, hand skills. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, and the bookbinder is uh, is on the uh, on the front. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, you know, I ha I have weird little niches within my collection too. I, I collect photographs of book binders, so antique photographs or postcards of binderies, things like that, which I don't have any of those out, but yeah, I, I have uh, quite a bit of those. And I want to start uh, an article on the Guild of Book Workers newsletter um, uh, on some of that stuff um, when I have time, I guess. <laughs> it could make an interesting traveling exhibit some of your books, book plates, photographs, the, telling the uh, the history of uh, bookbinding in US. True. Yeah. Hope, hopefully, we'll have book fairs again. <laughs> I'm in the near future. <laughs> yeah. And and I don't know. You know, I, that's kind of why we like traveling so much is because there's not a whole lot of book things around here, and so whenever we travel, that's, that's one of my things, you know, we can go to whatever stores she wants to go to. I'll go to those, but we got to go to bookstores. <laughs> so. uh, when Stepan travels with, uh, with his uh, wife, uh, they always visit all the, all the possible book related museums, shops. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just trying to check uh, uh, how old the oldest Dutch uh, book on book binding is. Oh, I see something like 17th. 16th century uh no it's 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 i think it's the end of uh, the 18th century oh so okay. the, the the author is hendrik de haas and uh, he lived uh, in the in the second uh, part of the 18th century and in, in the last quarter and that, that's uh, that's strange because i'm pretty sure i've seen uh, german books on book binding that are much much older like yeah. centuries older yeah yeah there are there are german books that are older but I, I, I found the book, but I don't, don't see the information about the uh, first publication dates. And then yeah. the, the Dudan book on, uh, or Dudan book on uh, book binding. Not sure where the country of origin is for that, but I, there's somebody in town here in Kansas City, which is amazing to me, that owns the first edition of that, which I've been trying to trade him stuff for years for. <laughs> But uh, no luck. So, but that that book I think is 1780s, 1790s, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah. Before that, and even even during the 19th century, many of the uh, trade secret trade uh, techniques uh, were kept quite secret. So uh, it's not surprising that there were no books before that, because uh, I guess the the guilds would be uh, quite against uh, uh, publishing anything like that. Especially those marblers. The marblers, I think, are, I mean, not, not today, but back then the marblers were really protective over their paper making, you know, their decorating skills. So, yeah. Well, uh, well, actually, uh, depending on the trade, uh, effect of the guilds could be quite the opposite. Like uh, with shoes, say, the instructions how you make a shoe could be very, very detailed. Like how many nails you have, how many 
times you can knock on a nail so that everyone makes the same product and he can't drive his prices up because his, hours, his uh, results are better. So there were guilds like that too, which is really weird to a modern mind, but they were protecting their, uh, their job. Mm -hmm. If everyone is the same, everyone has equal opportunity. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. Huh. Well, are you searching for something? Yeah, yeah. I've been trying to find the oldest German book on, on bookbinding. I'm pretty sure it's 16th century, like very, very early. Yeah, I had some digital copies, but I'm not sure I can can uh, uh, locate them uh, right now. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so sorry, I, I found something. So yeah, there is uh, Buchbinder Kunst uh, by. Uh, Zidler, the sur surname of the author, uh, oh, Zeidler, I guess. Yeah, Zeidler, it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, 1708. Yeah. So it's a century earlier than uh, than the, the first uh, English books on uh, bookbinding. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you can find digital version on uh, some uh, libraries and universities in Germany and uh, in Austria have these books. It's pretty available. So as usual, uh, I'd like to say thanks to our uh, viewers and uh, uh, our iBook Binding community and uh, special thanks to uh, our supporters on Patreon. Uh, with uh, your money, we pay for editing of uh, these podcasts and uh, that, uh, that helps us, uh, us a lot and we appreciate your uh, uh, help uh, very much, uh, especially as we are planning to, as I, as I told earlier, as we are planning to add the uh, uh, Spanish and French versions of our, of our podcast uh, to our channel. And uh, of course, it will demand even more money on editing of the videos and additional budget on uh, translating because we want uh, uh, these talks to be uh, available not only for French and Spanish speaking uh, uh, visitors, but also for English people, uh, English speaking uh, visitors. So if you've been considering uh, joining the crowd of uh, patrons on Patreon, please uh, uh, use the link below and uh, pledges start with uh, only a dollar per month or maybe it will be one euro or one pound depending on the country you live in. But still it's uh, for, for, I guess for most of our viewers, it's not uh, so much and uh, we will uh, appreciate your input a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us, Jay, today. Thank you, Pavel. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.